Luke chapter number 2, we're going to start reading down in verse number 41. It says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. When they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went with, and he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Our grace, Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this, your word. Lord, we're thankful that we have the word of God. Lord, Lord as I heard the other day, talking about all these different uh, languages and all these different countries that don't have uh, the word of God in their language, Lord. So we're just thankful that, Lord, that we have it. Uh, Lord, we can go down to the local Dollar Tree, Lord, and even be able to buy a copy of your word. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for what it can do to it, to do for us, Lord, to help us, to minister to us, Lord. Uh, Lord, so we just thank you for that tonight. Lord, we're thankful to be able to assemble tonight. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to preach. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity uh, to do anything for you, Lord, what you've done for me in my life. Lord, I ask you to just help what you've laid upon my heart. Lord, help me to give it to your people the way you gave it to me. Lord, it be a help to each and every one of us here this evening, Lord, to help each and every one of us, Lord, walk out of here tonight closer to you than what we was when we came in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first thing I'm gonna look at by way of introduction Can I be smart and say all I did was read? So I'm not too far ahead of the time you got here. Can I say the first thing I want to say by way of introduction is we see in verse number 43 is we see this staying as Jesus has stayed behind. And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Now, we obviously could get into the fact that they didn't even realize he was there. Uh, we could go back to talking about Samson and, and Samson not even realizing that the, the strength of God had left him when he got up that day. Uh, but we just see Jesus staying uh, in verse number 43. I think the problem is in verse number 44 when we see the supposing. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey and sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. How many times do we come into church? How many times do we do anything and we just suppose Jesus is going to show up? Uh, we just walk in here on a Sunday morning. We just walk in on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. And we just suppose and we just hope that the man of God has spent time with the Lord. Uh, that he's sought God and he's got the word of uh, whatever it is that God's laid upon his heart. We just suppose Jesus is going to show up. Amen. How much time have we spent hoping, how much time have we spent in prayer praying that God shows up when we come in here? We've seen that so many times just suppose that God's going to do this. Well, I just suppose that, you know, I've not read my Bible the way I have this week, and I've not uh, studied the way I'm supposed to this week, and I've not prayed how I'm supposed to this week, but I suppose God's just going to show up on Sunday, meet with me, we, meets, whoo, slow down, meet with me anyway. You know, we need to get over the supposing and truthfully seek him that it sees in verse 45. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Uh, so we see in verse number 45, they truly seeked him. How much do you truly seek him today? How much time during the week do you truly seek him? I don't normally do this, but I'm about to fry. How much time do you truly seek him throughout the week? How much time do you spend in God's Word? How much time do you spend in prayer asking God and seeking God? Lord, if I, I, don't, if I show up on Sunday morning and I'm the only one that wants to worship, Lord, let it get on. Lord, if I'm the only one that wants to shout, let me be the one to shout. Let me be the one to do something for you. How much time do you spend seeking the Lord throughout the week? But we see now they've, they've reached, they've got back into Jerusalem. And in verse number 46, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. How, much, how good would it do for us 
is as these doctors and physicians and all those that were sitting around the Lord, how much good would it do us if we'd just be willing to just sit at the feet of Jesus and allow Jesus just to minister to us? How much good would it do us just to take that time? You know, we had last Sunday, uh, last Sunday at the jail, we had this dear lady, she was asking us, Brother Phil, that you had asking questions this morning, and she made the comment uh, last Sunday about sitting down reading the Bible, Brother Donald. She goes, how come every time I sit down, I get tired? She goes, I want to read. She goes, I sit down to read, then I get tired, or I get this, or I get that. You know, sometimes you just got to get rid of those distractions and just sit down and purpose it in your heart. Ain't nothing going to bother me. I'm just going to sit here with Jesus and let God do something. But we see the setting in verse 46, and we see the sorrow in verse number 48, supposedly. And when they saw him, they were amazed, and the mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Have you ever sorrowed because you lost the Lord? Have you ever come into church service and not been with God all day, and you see Brother Phil, you see somebody else shouting? Have you ever sat there and just been sorrowful? Boy, if I'd done what I should have done this week, I might be having the same time that he is. I know I, I, you know, I mentioned this a while ago, and I know everybody laughed, but why aren't we as excited as Brother Phil? Now, I'm not telling you have to jump and shout and, and, and all those kind of things, but how come, it, you know, I, I've heard Brother Doug say this, and I'll say it too, and I'm not trying to be mean, but if you could see from our vantage point so many that sit back there like that, what's God, has God not done something for us? Have we not talked tonight and then sang so much about heaven and a mansion and talked about how uh, if you'd realize sometimes instead of allowing your storm to tell you how big it is, if you would tell that storm how big your God is, we would be a little more excited. We'd have more to rejoice over. We would be sorrowful if we lost him. And then the last thing by way of introduction is verse number 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And if you go from here to 12 and you see then uh, Jesus, you know, we don't know much about him from then until it gets to the end and he calls his disciples. But what I want to focus on is found in verse number 51 today. A lot of what we're going to deal with, Brother uh, Scott talked about last week and things about from the heart and on your heart. And, and God laid this message on my heart a few weeks ago. In verse 51 it says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. So I would say she kept all those things and she might have pondered them in her heart or she thought about them in her heart or, or whatever it may be, but she just thought on those things. And that's what I want to give you tonight. I just want to give you a few things. I got, just got five things, some things to ponder. I don't want you to come in here and, and hey, if, if God lays on your heart to shout, God lays on your heart to go to the altar, whatever it may be, that's fine. But these are some things I want us to truly think about truly examine ourselves on where we are at in our relationship with God, where we are at in our daily walk with Him. The first one is, is uh, you see, uh, we talk about, and I'm so thankful. Look, don't get me wrong here, okay? I am so thankful for all those that do so much around the church. We don't give a second thought to pulling up in front of the church on a Sunday or Wednesday in the yard being mowed. We don't give a second thought to coming in and, and the bathrooms being cleaned and, and the, the, the floor being vacuumed and all those things that are done. We don't give a second thought to coming in and, and knowing that the Sunday school teachers have prepared uh, a, a lesson for our children, our grandchildren, or for ourselves in one of the adult Sunday school rooms. We don't think anything about that. So if you do those things, thank the Lord for you. But let me ask you a question. Do you work out of duty or passion? In, Genesis, or in Galatians chapter number 6 and verse number 9, it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. Do you do the same things now that you did years ago out of duty or passion? If you come out here to clean, or you come out here to uh, uh, count the money, or you come out here to mow, or, or you get ready to sit down and study for your Sunday school lesson, do you count that as a blessing to be able to do anything for God? Or do you do it with the attitude, well, if I don't go do it, who's going to? If I don't show up and teach these kids this morning, ain't nobody else going to teach. Nobody else volunteered to teach in, in 50 years since I've been here. Well, ain't nobody been here 50 years, but Brother Clint, maybe. <laughs> but do you do it out of duty or passion? When you do a work for God, is it because you just feel like you're obligated to? Or is it because you love God and you want to give anything back? Amen. I know what God's done in my life. I, I said beforehand, it is an honor and a privilege not just to preach His Word, but to do anything for Him. Yeah, 
because I know what He's brought me through. I know what He's done in my life. I know the blessings I have on my life because of Him. But too many times we get into that, we get too weary in well-doing, and we feel like we just got to do this or we've got to do that, and we've lost that love and passion that we should have to want to do it because we love God because we know what He's done for us. Amen. Not out of obligation, not because we feel like, well, if I don't do it, who's going to? It'll still get done. Amen. Do we work out of love or do we work out of duty? The second thing I want to ask you tonight is are you a peacekeeper or a peace speaker. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19. I'll explain to you what I'm talking about. The Bible, we all know this verse. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You come into contact with somebody this week, somebody that's lost, on their way to hell, somebody that's living in wickedness. Are you not going to tell them about that? Because you just want to keep the peace. I don't want to ruffle any feathers, Brother Charlie. Or do you tell them about the one and speak to them about the peace that only God can give? See, I'm afraid that, and just my opinion, I'm afraid that we are in the position that we are in today because too many Christians have been more interested in being peacekeepers than peace speakers. We've been too interested in, well, I don't want to ruffle any feathers and I don't want to make my coworker mad or I don't want to make my boss mad. I don't want to make my neighbor mad. And so I just, you know, I, I, I don't want to do this or do that. So we just, we tend not to say anything. We just allow things to go, and before you know it, everything is snowballed, and now all of a sudden, look at the condition that we're in. You know, I can read about it. I didn't even realize this until a few months ago. I read about, they talked about uh, when Major League Baseball first started playing on Sundays, they would only play in the afternoon so everybody could go to church. And then, Brother Tommy, what I read is that if the game went extra, they would call, they'd stop it so everybody could go to church. Now, everything goes on on Sunday. We don't care. You know, you hear everything talked about back in, in some of the times when uh, some of you might be a little bit older than me growing up that everything wasn't open on Sunday. You couldn't go to the restaurant. You couldn't, if you needed gas, you better got it on Saturday, Brother Mike, because you wasn't getting it on Sunday. But what happened? They just slowly started pushing the envelope a little bit. Brother Doug alluded to it Wednesday night, talking about working. Uh, and those type, they just slowly started pushing buttons, Brother Donald. We just sat back and let it happen. And now we're in the condition we're in now. You have all this stuff that goes on, and why do people want, some people, want, it amazes me, the number of people that I can listen to, and the number of people that I can see that by all accounts know nothing about church, don't seem to know nothing about God, but will speak out against some of the wickedness that's going on more than Christians. Because we just don't want to upset anybody. We're more interested in keeping the peace than we are telling them about the one true peace speaker. You got some things going on in your life you're not sure about? You don't know what bathroom to use? Well, let me introduce you to a God that'll tell you he created man and woman, he created male and female, and he'll help you get some things straightened out. Are you more interested in being a peacekeeper or peace speaker? The third thing, I asked this question in jail this morning. And there's a lot of ways I can go with this. So if Brother Brian remembers, he probably knows what question I'm about ready to ask. Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 8. The Bible says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. Would you die for you? Now, if you answer yes to that question, I'm going to tell you that the altar is open. Now, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to say I, I, I know how too many of us are. The Bible tells us there is none that doeth, to good, none that doeth good. Would you die for you? And I would be willing to say that if we was all honest, every one of us in here would say, well, no, I know the thoughts that I've had today, the things I've done today. I know the type of person that I'm capable of being. Brother Jordan alluded to it this morning. How aggravated do we get? I, I'm driving here the, this evening also. Had some guy, yeah, I'm running 55 down Pleasant Valley. Last I seen everything posted says 45. So I'm doing 10 over. This guy's about to run over me. He's going so fast. You know, and, and I... Miss Tina can't listen to this. So I'm going to come over here and make sure you want to hear me. So I did not cross the white line, Brother Tommy, but I did get right on the edge of it. And he gets up there and he's looking at me. So I just, I, I, I didn't do anything. I just looked at him. I went, 45. That's it. 45. We needed a Boone County Sheriff to clock him at some point in time. If I'm doing 10 over and you're about to fly past me, you're going too fast. This isn't the Autobahn. We don't live in Germany. But Brother Jordan alluded to it this morning. That was one of those things where he just cut off his pinky toe. Just, just so he would think about it next time. And you know, sometimes we have those thoughts. 
And that sounds terrible, but we have those things we thought of. I'd just like to get in there and just smack the guy upside the head. Slow down. You know, you got right around the curve up there. There's three people off on the sidewalk looking for something. He loses control. He's wiped out three people just because he's in a hurry to get who knows where. But too many times, but we, we think about that and the type of person we're capable of being. We seem to lose sight of the fact that Jesus gave up everything that we sang about tonight Amen. to come into this world, walk some 32 years, go to a cross, go through a beating that we can't imagine, people spitting in his face, plucking out his beard, walk up that road to Calvary, and lay down his life for us. Amen. Think about that. We seem to have gotten over the fact that we have a, a, a thrice holy God that laid down his life for me, Brother Donald. Amen. How wicked I can be. How, how just, doing, just not doing the things that I'm supposed to do that the Bible talks about, that Brother Jordan talked about this morning, that I'll try to make excuse for. Well, today I was just too busy to read everything I wanted to read. Today I just had too much going on uh, to pray the way I needed to pray. And knowing all of that, he still died for me, Brother Christian. He still laid down his life for us. We seem to lose sight of the fact that he was willing to come and pay the ultimate sacrifice so that we can live forever in heaven. That we can talk about and we can sing about, Brother Ray, that mansion. We can look forward to that mansion that we have. And we ain't going to have to worry about if it's lined up straight. And yeah, it's just It should thrill us to know of what we have to look forward to. The fourth thing, and I told you I only had five. I am hot. I'm going to explain this here in just a second because you might, when I first asked this question and when God first gave it to me, I kind of thought the same thing. It kind of sounds the same to me. Do you resist sin or do you hate sin? Do you resist sin or do you hate sin? Now, we know the Bible tells us resist the devil and he will flee from you. So I, to, to me, there's a difference. I've been here long enough that most of you, I'll just be honest with you, most of you have probably seen... You know, Brother Josh, he kind of swells up a little bit, and then he'll go back down a little bit. And he'll swell up a little bit, and he'll start trying to resist chocolate, and Miss Lisa's laughing at me. He'll resist chocolate for a little bit and resist food a little bit, and then we'll go back down a little bit, Brother, Brother Ron, and then go back up and go back down. I've done it four or five times. Because I get to that point that I just resist, Brother Ray. I'm just, I'm just not going to eat chocolate. The problem now has turned into it's not just chocolate. I just like to eat, Miss Mary. I just like, I sat down and ate lunch today, and we, all I had was warmed up hamburgers. Warmed up a hamburger, ate it, and thought, man, that was good, I'm still hungry, and ate another one. After the second one, I was like, boy, that was a mistake, and that was dumb. I am miserable now. But see, I'll resist those things for a little while. And when we resist them for a little while, see, we tend to fall right back to it sometimes. We can resist it, and I can stand it for a little while. But when we hate something, we want no part of it. I remember being younger. My mom loved these things. I remember my mom making these up one time, and she, she laid them, put them on the kitchen table, and I tried one, Brother Mike. Chicken livers. Nastiest thing I've ever had in my mouth. I hate them. I hate them so much, I've never been willing to try them again. You're not going to tell me you fried them in whatever you want to do. I refuse to eat something that I would use for fish baits. Not going to happen. I hate it. Wanted no part of it. But see, when I was younger, I remember eating green beans and getting sick. So for the longest time, I said I hated green beans. We got married. Miss Tina loves green beans. We'd eat green beans for the longest time. I still wouldn't try and miss Mary. I, we'd have a little bowl of uh, uh, pot of green beans, and the th all three of the females in the house would get green beans. Dad didn't eat any. Well, then it got to where I just resisted them. Well, I'll try a bite. I'll try two bites. And before you know it, hey, I'll eat some green beans now. Well, I won't eat as much as they do, but I'll still eat some green beans. Because I didn't hate them that much. I've still never tried chicken livers again. I'm not, I've only tried Chinese one time, Brother Jim. Didn't like it. I ain't going to try it again either. Hate it. Nasty. I'm with Brother Doug on that one. That's gross. So do we resist sin or do we hate it? See, too many times we just resist it because we think, well, I shouldn't do that. But then we think about it long enough. Well, I can just do it just a little bit. I, I find it hard to believe. I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong about this. But I find it hard to believe that any addict, when they were younger, said, you know what, I want to grow up and be an addict. I want to grow up and be an alcoholic. 
I want to grow up and I want to blow all my, all, every single paycheck I have on gambling. I want to be addicted to gambling. I want to be addicted to anything like that that's bad. No, it's because they just dabbled in a little bit, Brother Donald. They didn't resist it. They didn't hate it enough to stay away from it. They just resisted it a little bit. Now, I'll, I'll just try a little bit. And a little bit turned in a little bit more and a little bit more. And before you know it, they're full-fledged into sin. Right. And too many times, that's how sin gets us. We don't hate it enough to stay away from it. We just well, try to resist it. Well, I'm just, I'm just going to stay away a little bit. No, I'm, just, I'm not going to get all into, you know, I'll just, if I just go a little bit here and there, it'll be okay. And we don't hate it, Brother Phil. We're not, the Bible tells us to abstain from all appearance of evil. We don't hate it enough to abstain from all appearance. Right. I understand completely, I, I understand completely what I'm about to say as Brother Doug talks about his convictions, not passing alcohol uh, to the next person at a ball game because the last thing he needs is for the Lord to come back and him have a, a cup of beer in his hand even just to pass it on or, or him to be put I remember he talked one time him be put on the jumbotron everybody look there's brother Doug Foster he's got a beer in his hand and I understand that's his conviction and I'm not no, by no means and he would tell you the same thing you're not trying to push his convictions on us but sometimes it would do us good to be willing to hate evil to hate sin and stay away from it that much that we're not even going to give it a chance to come into our life we're not even going to give it a chance to do anything. If, if there's something that I, can't, that I can't deal with, if there's a, a habit or something like that that I can't deal with, just staying away from it. You know, I tell people, I, this is in my mind, so I'm going to say it. My mom and dad got divorced when I was two years old because my dad was an alcoholic. Tina will tell you, I have a very addictive personality. Growing up, there would be people in my family and things like that would drink. We would go work in the back and you would have people to drink. I did not drink, Brother Jim, because I thought, hey, I shouldn't do it because I go to church. It's because I knew enough at that point in time to know I didn't want to turn into what he was. What little bit I knew then, I didn't want that. So I would stay away from it. It would do us good sometimes to realize there's things in our life that we might not handle well and we don't need to resist it. We need to stay away from it. If I know, uh, you know, I talked about the weight thing. If I know that I'm not going to be good at resisting it, I need to stay away from Golden Corral. Because I can go there and eat all the cake and ice cream and everything that I want. I can go there and just go get some pasta and go get this and get, load up on carbs and then load up on sugar. That's not going to be good for me. We need to stay away from those things. But too many times we don't hate sin enough. We just resist it a little. We're okay with the dabble. It would do us good if instead of just resisting, we would absolutely hate it and the last thing and this is what i believe is a big issue in where we are today i know i touched on this a little bit talking about a peacekeeper or a peace speaker are you a nice christian or are you a sold out christian now being sold out does not mean that we cannot be nice i understand that and i'm not trying to say that but too many times we have things that come up in our lives, in our families, or whatever it may be, and we just try to be nice and it'll, it'll be okay. Instead of being willing to be sold out and just say, that's wrong. Plain and simple, that's wrong. It, it don't need to be going on. Amen. It is amazing to me how this past week, how many things I have seen, and, and, and I'm not trying to ruffle any feathers in here or make anybody mad, but when this gentleman that we have in the White House announced whatever day it was this week that he was going to forgive $10,000 in student debt. If you have $10,000 that's being forgiven, amen, awesome, good for you. But it amazes me the people that are some people that think it's crazy of how many people I have seen try to compare that to God and compare that to Christians having their sins being forgiven. And like, well, Jesus forgave you, and now all of a sudden they want to forgive $10,000 in debt, and you're like, no, 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 no. And I've seen this, I've heard this at work, I've seen this from multiple people online and things like that. I'm like, you cannot compare those two things. It is apples and oranges, number one. But the problem is, too many times, Brother Donald, we're just set back and it's like, well, that's just their opinion. And we won't be willing to speak up and say, that's blasphemy, that's wrong, and you need to stop. You look at everything that's going on. It's funny how uh, when you had Trump in office and everybody would be like, well, if you support Donald Trump, you support this and you support that. No, I don't support everything the man does, but I supported a lot of the policies that he had. 
And now when you have the abortion thing and they overturn Roe v. Wade and people up in arms and, oh, you've taken away the freedom of choice and like, so, so you're okay for murdering babies? Oh, no, no, no. I just think that if, you're, if this happens to somebody, they should have the option. No, you can't have it both ways. But as Christians, too many times, we're willing to just stand back and say, that's okay, they can have their opinion. Instead of sold out and saying, no, it's murder and it's wrong. You see so much stuff that's going on. I don't know why I'm touching on this, too. You see so much out there in the world talking about homosexuality. And, and our pastor talks about what's going on in the schools and how willing are we to walk into school and say it's wrong and it's not going to take place. Right. But See, we get to hide behind the fact that ain't nothing going to change. I'm just one person. And that therein lies our problem. We are too much into wanting to be a nice Christian because we don't think we can solve the problem as opposed to being sold out Christian and being willing to stand up and say, no, it's wrong and it's going to get out of here and I'm going to have other people standing behind me and let our voice be heard the same way they do. You know, I talked about this a little bit Thursday night back in the men's meeting. As the old saying goes, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Why does so much of that stuff get pushed? Because they're the squeaky wheel. They're the ones that will shout from the rooftop that they should have their rights, or they should have this, or they should have that. And we just step back and say, well, it's just, you know, whatever. The Lord will come back. He'll show them one day. And we're too busy, excuse me, trying to be a nice Christian as opposed to being a sold-out Christian. There is a time and place that we must be willing to make a stand. We must be willing to stand up and say, no, that's wrong. This is what's got to take place. This is what the Bible says about that. I'm not going to give you my opinion. I'm going to give you truth on what the Word of God says. How many times are we willing to stand up and be a sold-out Christian? I'm afraid that we have had it so good for so long, and I don't know how much in here. Uh, I don't watch the news, but I just try to read stuff every now and then. I don't know if we understand how much truly goes on in this world that we don't wake up and realize it's going to come to America. How many places there are that used to have uh, the Bible preached and how many times, how much they have tried to shut it off? Do you realize this week, and, and this, well, hopefully this should encourage you a little bit. You know, you see uh, Elisha sitting there and he, he thinks everybody's left and he's the only one that's left and he wants to die under the juniper tree. And God tells him, he's like, no, I, I have plenty that haven't bowed to Baal. So this past week, this was probably a few weeks ago, there was a Christian school down in Florida. That Christian school sends out, uh, I heard an interview uh, this week with the guy that runs it, I believe, that he said every year they send out an email. This is some things that are being popular that's going on right now, and you have to understand this is not allowed at our school. He said it could be dress code, it might be, or whatever it may be. He said, but every year that email goes out. This year that email went out talking about homosexuality. Just so you know, if you think that's okay, if you want to come out of the closet and you want to say this, you're not welcome in our school. It is against God and you cannot be here. Amen. You know, the first thing to share that, I guess they said was a bunch of, this is his words, a bunch of liberal news media. He got hate mail. He got death threats. The first Sunday after that came out, they had to have an enlarged police presence just, at the, uh, just to have church. But he said once everybody else picked it up, and some of the other more conservative things picked it up. He said that when I heard the interview, I believe it was on Thursday this week, the two or three days before that, he had taken in over $30,000 in donations. Telling him, say, just stay strong, Brother Phil. You just keep standing on the Word of God. Just, just keep standing for what's right, and we're there for you. He said now their waiting list to get in that school has actually grown, Brother Jim people want to say if that's what that school's about i want my kids to go to that school because all they wanted to report about brother donald was the homosexuality and he said that wasn't all that was in that email he said the bible talks about uh, those relationships being between a man and a woman who are married if you want to come into school and you want to brag about what you went out and did over the weekend you're not welcome here we don't we don't handle that kind of stuff here that's not what the bible's about that's not what we're teaching he said but all they wanted to focus on was that what I'm trying to say, there's a lot of people out there that are willing to stand if we would just be willing to stand also. Right. Instead of just trying to be Mr. Nice Guy and please everybody, being willing to say, no, that's wrong. It's sinful, it's against God, and I'm going to be sold out and do whatever it is that I can for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Are you a nice Christian or a sold out Christian? There's going to be a time, we, we can believe it or not, but the way this world is headed, there's going to be a time where you're going to have to check at the door if you're going to be willing to die for him. If you're going to be willing to, if they come in and try to lock the doors, look, I used to say it all the time, what are you going to do when we come and the doors are locked? And we thought, well, that's far-fetched, that's crazy. Well, 
What was it now? 27 months ago, they sure did it. Thankfully, we didn't close. We still had some people to come in and was able to live stream, but there's a lot that closed down and have never reopened. Are we going to be a nice Christian the next time that comes up? When they try to declare some pandemic and something going on and they try to shut down churches again, are we going to be willing to stand or are we going to be willing to say, are we going to be willing to stand up and say, no, you're not going to shut us down? Or are we going to be, well, let's just keep the peace. Let's, what, hey, whatever, whatever they want, we're we willing to do. Some things to ponder, some things to think about. Why do you work? Do you work out of love? Do you work out of wanting to give back to God? Do you work out of just uh, feeling the need to? Are we a peace speaker? Or a peacekeeper? Do you hate sin? Do you resist sin? Are you a nice Christian or a sold out Christian? I asked Brother uh, Ray to come get a, ver a song of invitation. Miss Renee, come tonight. I ask you to examine yourselves, whether during this invitation or as you go home this week, and ask God where you are in your relationship to Him. Let's all stand as they get a song of invitation. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. Lord, we're thankful for everything you've done for us. Lord, we're thankful that we have a God to serve, uh, Lord, that is long-suffering. Lord, that we, if we find ourselves, uh, Lord, not doing what you would have us to do, Lord, we're thankful that you're long-suffering to us, Lord, that uh, you're willing to just, uh, uh, Lord, give us a second, third, fourth, and fifth chances, Lord. I ask you to speak to hearts now during this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.